Welcome to episode 4 of Real Talk on the Radiant Unsanity YouTube channel. This presentation is entitled The Cause of All Diseases, Part 1. You Cannot Catch Germs, Bacteria, or Viruses. This presentation is based off a paper written in 2006 by B. Wilder. It explains the cause of disease, including candida yeast overgrowth and cancer. The fact is you do not and cannot catch germs, bacteria, or viruses, nor can you catch candida overgrowth or cancer. The following text disproves the germ theory of disease, as promoted by the medical industry today, which was initiated by Louis Pasteur in the early 1800s. A plagiarist is someone who uses another person's words or ideas as if they were his own. An imposter is someone who attempts to deceive. Louis Pasteur was a French microbiologist and chemist, born on December 27, 1822, in Dole, in the region of Jura, France. His discovery that most infectious diseases are caused by germs, known as the germ theory of disease, became the foundation for the science of microbiology and a cornerstone of modern medicine. Pasteur also developed pasteurization, which was named after him. It is a process by which harmful microbes and perishable food products are destroyed using heat without destroying the food. However, this is not true. Pasteurization does not kill all supposedly harmful microbes, and it definitely does damage food by destroying natural enzymes and nutrients. Louis Pasteur was not an honest and credible individual. If you look back into the history of the medical profession and the various ideas regarding the cause of disease that were held by leading physicians before Pasteur first promulgated his notorious germ theory, you will find convincing evidence that Pasteur discovered nothing and that he deliberately appropriated, falsified, and perverted another man's work. His true character and methods were brought to light by Miss Ethel Douglas Hume in her book Pasteur or Beauchamp, written in 1923, the title of which has since been changed to Pasteur Exposed. Another book by R. B. Pearson, Pasteur, Plagiarist, Imposter, was originally published in the 1940s with a new edition entitled The Dream and Lie of Louis Pasteur. Interestingly enough, Pasteur instructed his family never to release his lab notes. After his grandson died in 1975, they were finally released. Gerald Geisen, a science historian, was among the first people to thoroughly review those notes. In 1995, which was ironically proclaimed the year of Pasteur, Geisen's article was published in the New York Times proclaiming that Pasteur had lied about his research on vaccines and germs and that most of his ideas had been plagiarized from his contemporaries. His article, Pasteur's Deception, claimed that Pasteur was, in the end, a fraud. It was Antoine Beauchamp, a contemporary of Pasteur, who discovered the true nature of germs, bacteria, viruses, etc., and that they were pleomorphic, capable of changing from one type of organism to another. Later on, another colleague of Pasteur's colleagues, Claude Bernard, described the milieu or environment that affected those changes. On his deathbed, Pasteur recanted, saying that Claude Bernard was right. The terrain is everything, the germ is nothing. However, since the germ theory of disease is so profitable, the medical world has written off his final statements as the madness of a dying man. Another problem with the germ theory of disease is discovered when we look at Koch's postulates. Postulate means accepted statements of fact. The germ which causes a disease must be found in every case of a disease under the conditions which could explain the disease. The germ must not be found in other diseases or healthy people. The germ could be isolated and used to induce an experimental disease in animals which resembles the original disease in humans. Pasteur never quite fulfilled all of these rules. He was not able to find the germ in all cases of a disease, and this is where his research became fraudulent. Additionally, many so-called pathogenic germs are often found in healthy people. 
And finally, when Pasteur passed a germ from one animal to another to cause the disease, he did not pass the germ alone, but took some blood with it. Injecting toxic blood from one animal to another will guarantee the receiving animal becomes sick. Professor Antoine Beauchamp, a French biologist who was Pasteur's contemporary, developed and demonstrated a pleomorphic theory, essentially that bacteria change form and are not the cause of, but the result of disease. Professor Antoine Beauchamp, a French biologist who was Pasteur's contemporary, developed and demonstrated a pleomorphic theory, essentially that bacteria change form and are not the cause of, but the result of disease, arising from tissues rather than from a germ of constant form. This has also been called the cellular disease theory. Beauchamp discovered that these microorganisms, germs, feed upon the poisonous material which they find in the sick organism and prepare it for excretion. These tiny organisms are derived from still tinier organisms called microzyma. These microzyma are present in the tissues and blood of all living organisms where they remain normally quiet and non-acting and harmless. When the welfare of the human body is threatened by the presence of potentially harmful material, a transmutation takes place. The microzyma changes into a bacterium or virus, which immediately goes to work to rid the body of this harmful material. When the bacteria or viruses have completed their task of consuming the harmful material, they automatically revert to the microzyma stage. Beauchamp himself wrote, I draw the conclusion that normal air never contains morbid microzymas, or what used to be called germs of diseases, and are now called microbes, maintaining in accord with the old medical aphorism that diseases are born of us and in us, that no one has ever been able to communicate a characteristic disease of the nosological class, such as anthrax, smallpox, typhoid fever, cholera, plague, tuberculosis, hydrophobia, syphilis, etc. by taking the germ in the air, but they are isolated from a patient at some particular moment. Beauchamp's academic record includes Master of Pharmacy, Doctor of Science, Doctor of Medicine, Professor of Medicinal Chemistry and Pharmacy at Montpellier, Fellow and Professor of Physics and Toxicology, Strasbourg Higher School of Pharmacy, Professor of Chemistry at Strasbourg, Professor of Biological Chemistry and Dean of Faculty of Medicine of Lille. Pleomorphism means many forms, many or more, forms or bodies capable of changing from one type of organism to another. This is in contradistinction to monomorphism, which means one body or form. Modern medicine, bacteriology, is founded on the idea of monomorphism, where once a germ is a particular germ, it always stays that way. According to this way of thinking, a streptococcal germ is always a streptococcus. It only has one form. It doesn't change into anything else. However, that is not true. Streptococcal germs and many other kinds of germs, bacteria, and viruses can and do change into other forms proven to occur by many eminent researchers since the early 1800s, including Gaston Nasons, Gunther Enderlein, Royal Reif, Antoine Beauchamp, and others. Even modern medicine recognizes that bacteria and viruses change into stronger ones, becoming resistant to antibiotic drugs. Pleomorphism is a concept discovered in the early 1800s it shows that germs, bacteria, and viruses come from inside the body, from the tiny dots you can see in the blood with any microscope. These tiny dots, of course, are the colloids of life, or proteids. Pleomorphism is a concept that today sounds very strange. What pleomorphism is, however, cannot be denied as the vast amount of data that has been obtained over the last 180 years confirms what modern microbiologists are rediscovering today. As noted, many people have been involved in this debate for a long time. 
Tiny microbes are tiny dots in our blood that change form into microorganisms that clean up the garbage, dead cells, toxins, and cellular debris. This is what bacteria, germs, and viruses are for. They change first into viruses, then into bacteria, and finally into fungal forms. Each of these stages is progressively more hostile to surrounding tissue cells. Germs, all microorganisms, viruses, bacteria, fungi, and everything in between, are the result, not the cause of disease. Louis Pasteur was wrong. His idea of the bacterial cause of disease was wrong. If germs are there as a result, not a cause, then to treat the resultant germs with antibiotics is in theory and in fact wrong. This basic misconception about disease affects all aspects of medicine. This is why this is a new biology, even though it has been proved by many doctors and scientists starting in the early 1800s. Beauchamp stated in an address before the Academy of Medicine on the 3rd of May, 1870, that nothing is more obscure than the cause which presides over the development of diseases and their communicability. But what we can affirm is that when we are sick, it is we who suffer, and that the suffering is a cruel reality. This is because the cause of our diseased condition is always within ourselves. External causes contribute to the development of the affliction and hence of the disease only because they have brought about some material modification of the medium, in which live the ultimate particles of the organized matter which constitutes us, namely, the microzymas. These external causes, by a succession of changes brought about and depending on a crowd of variables, bring about correlatively a further change which then bears precisely upon the physiological and chemical status of the microzymas. The living being filled with microzymas carries in itself the elements essential for life, disease, death, and destruction. Note, Beauchamp called these tiny microbes microzyma, while Gaston Nasons called them somatids and Gunther Enderlind called them proteids. In 1973, Dr. D. Powell's observed the major contributing factor towards improved health over the past 200 years has been improved nutrition. Nearly 90% of the total decline in the death rate in children between 1860 and 1965 due to whooping cough, scarlet fever, diphtheria, and measles occurred before the introduction of antibiotics and widespread immunization against diphtheria. Epidemiologist Dr. G.T. Stewart made a similar statement which was reported in Lancet of May 18, 1968. And prior to this, Sir Robert McCarrison, the great English physician, wrote, Obsessed with the invisible microbe, virus, protozoa, as all important exigents of disease, subservient to laboratory methods of diagnosis, hidebound by our system of nomenclature, we often forget the most fundamental of all rules for the physician, that the right kind of food is the most important single factor in the promotion of health and the wrong kind of food, the most important single factor in the promotion of disease. In a personal communication in 1974, Dr. Klenner made the following important observations. Many here voice a silent view that the Salk and Sabin vaccine, being made of monkey kidney tissue, has been directly responsible for the major increase of leukemia in this country. Your own Dr. Nossel from the Institute of Medical Research, Melbourne, Australia, made the statement which was published in our Medical Tribune that most killed vaccines in use today were not fit for a mouse. Elsewhere in the same communication, Dr. Klenner astutely sums up some pertinent reasons for our inability to make successful viral vaccines as follows. I am of the opinion that virus units have the potential of going from one type to another by just altering their protein coat. We see chicken pox at Thanksgiving, mumps by Christmas, red measles in the spring, and polio. And what we now know was Coxsackie in the summer. 
When the red measles vaccine was given to the children in our community, we immediately had an epidemic of sore throats and many of the older people demonstrated complex spots. These viewpoints appear to constitute food for thought. Moreover, it is disappointing to observe the futility and ineffectiveness of many flu vaccines that have been accepted by an unwary public. If we consider Beauchamp's thesis that viruses and bacteria can be extensions of enzymes, microzymas, that there are specific disease conditions rather than specific diseases, that the virus and the bacterium are not the per precursors of disease, it is not conceivable that these entities may become, by evolution and nutritional breakdown, the viruses and bacteria we are studying so intently? Is Klenner right? Was Beauchamp right? Is this why we cannot make a successful vaccine? A further search of the relevant literature produced the following. S. typhi has been isolated from surgical wounds and gallbladders of patients not known to be typhoid carriers. Showing the influence of orthodoxy, the article then concludes that these patients are infection hazards. We wonder aloud how many infection hazards would we detect if we did a bacteriological survey upon the passengers of a jumbo jet. Surveys that we have participated in show that a large percentage of the sample may indeed carry so-called pathogens without any clinical symptoms of disease. Perhaps it is time we revised the word pathogen. W. A. Altemeyer describes the increase of mixed infections which he alleges are due to indiscreet use of antibiotics, which produces viral and fungal forms which are much more difficult to control. Altemeyer then describes how the bacterial flora is ever-changing and cites a case of septicemia, which began as staphylococcal infection and then successively transformed from pseudomonas to bacterioids E. coli, E. aerogenes, anaerobic streptococcus, serratia, and finally proteus. If a child develops measles, chickenpox, whooping cough, mumps, rubella, or any other common childhood infection, it is not because of germs, but because of the accumulated toxic waste within the body, a condition known as toxemia. Please continue to part two.